back um, and how things are going. And uh, Pastor Angie's been teaching, of course, there. She's one of the keynote speakers. And then it kind of culminates on a Friday night. <coughs> so she's been asked to take the Friday night um, meeting, which I think they got it right. But I'm biased, okay? <laughs> Praise God. So we're so excited to, uh, about what's going on there in, in the ladies' lives. There's about 100 ladies up there, praise God. Also, um, getting just great reports back from Camp Decision. Our youth are at Camp Decision. You know, this is the 24th year for Camp Decision, praise God. And it's neat to see because there are <coughs> parents here who went to Camp Decision and their children are at Camp Decision. And uh, it's a, basically a RAMA. It, it was founded by a RAMA graduate 24 years ago. And uh, it's just exciting to see the, uh, the impact that it has, but the momentum that it's gaining, too, you know. And uh, <clears throat> there's 970 youth there tonight. And uh, they called me, and they said that they had, uh, they were maxed out capacity. And I believe, if I got this correct, the camp runs for four weeks. It's like a month long. And so they cycle out, you know, a group of uh, of young people, about a thousand come in, a thousand go out, another thousand come in, and they still had to turn away over four, at least four churches um, because they just were at capacity. So they're trying to figure out what do they do? They go to another week, which would be five weeks, it'd be over 5,000 kids that they'd be ministering to. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they said they have seen <clears throat> so many salvations the very first day they got there. They, they don't mess around. They, they, they just boom right in there with the word with them. And they, uh, Mike called me and said that they had a, s a salvation in our group, salvation, and I think seven of the kids rededicated their lives to the Lord to give God glory in every area and every aspect of their life, which was outstanding. Um, they said that they had one filled with the Holy Spirit in our group and had m many, many hundreds filled with the Spirit um, in, in, the, in the overall. <coughs> and... Uh, they committed again to give glory. Give, they committed to give their life glory to God. That the, that the glory of God that they would commit to that in their life. And uh, Mike called me again today. <clears throat> He's been giving me updates about every day. He called tonight. He said at 7:30 they um, asked it, uh, is when their meeting was beginning tonight, and they asked if we would be in agreement in prayer over them. And I said absolutely. What, what are we talking about? So we talked about that. He said they all week have been expecting, and this is what they're expecting, they're expecting healings, miraculous healings to take place in the young people's lives. They're expecting deliverance in areas they need deliverance from. They're expecting boldness in Christ to rise up within them for Jesus at, at, uh, no matter where they're at. They're expecting not only to know what they're saved from, but to know what they're saved for. I thought that was really good. And the last thing they said that we would be praying for is clarity. They want to make sure they have clarity. They said when, they, when there's clarity in their life, things become easy. And so they want to have clarity. They're believing for clarity of what friends to have, what influences to be around, clarity in listening to the Lord, that they get the distractions out, and clarity for their Christian life. Praise God. That sounds like a plan. So before we go into our, our <coughs> teaching tonight, let's, uh, I'd like us for all of us to pray together. That's what they requested, and that's what we're going to do. Amen? So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you, Father, for, our, for the youth from West Coast Word Church, from the youth that have come from all over, from many states, Lord, that are gathered tonight at Camp Decision. 970 young people that have made commitments to you, that have recommitted their lives to you, those who have been filled with the Spirit, those who have committed to give their life glory unto you, to live it as the glory of God unto you, Lord. And as they are there gathered together, and their expectation as they've been praying and believing, and they're releasing their faith tonight for healings to take place in their lives, physical healings, mental and emotional healings in the name of Jesus are being brought forth or taking place right now in Jesus' name. Deliverance, deliverance from all kinds of evil, all kinds of perverted thinking and living in the name of Jesus. Deliverance in Jesus' name. Boldness to rise up from within them. 
to live for Jesus Christ, that they would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you, Father, that as they are there tonight, that there is a great surrendering, that they are surrendering to you, Lord, in ways that were in areas of their life that they need to lay down, that they need to surrender unto you, Lord, and any ungodly thing in their life, that they are submitting it and surrendering it to you in Jesus' name. And in fact, anything that has just tried to be bigger or take precedence or be more important in their life, that they would yield that unto you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for revealing to them what they are saved from and what they are saved for. What their purpose in life is, that you would reveal to them tonight. Speak to their hearts, those who are called to ministry, those who are called to fivefold ministry, those who are called into the government, those who are called into leadership roles as CEOs and as, and as leaders and as city leaders and community leaders and, and, and federal leaders in Jesus' name, that you would call them and birth that within them and it would rise up big in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for the clarity to, to see and to know and to do. Clarity even to know who they are to, to befriend in their life and who are they to allow to be influences and what music they are to allow to influence them and to even put into their ears in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that their hearts in the name of Jesus would remain pure and holy unto you and that a mighty move of your spirit, your anointing in that place tonight. Touch every child, every leader, every musician, every speaker in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that they're coming back changed by your power, by your anointing. And Lord, I pray over my wife, Pastor Angie, and all the speakers at the women's retreat. I thank you, Lord, that there is a mighty move of God taking place, that there is such a reality of your love and your power in Jesus' name being released into the understanding and knowledge and it is grabbed a hold of, it is taken a hold of by the ladies at that retreat. I pray for a refreshing in them, a strengthening in them, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah, you're ready for the word, right? Well, you know, Jesus is the name that's above all. His name's above all. We sang about it tonight. Matt didn't know what I was going to teach, but I'm teaching about the name of Jesus. We sang a song about the name of Jesus, didn't we? Amen. You have your Bible? Go to Proverbs 23, 18, please. Mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Glory, 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 glory. Praise God. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible here. It says, for surely there is a latter end, a future, and a reward, and your hope, say your hope, say my hope, so don't lose, don't lose hope, okay? That's for somebody here. Don't lose hope. I said don't lose hope. Amen? Do not lose hope, because it says your hope and expectation shall not be cut off. Those young people tonight at Camp Decision, they said, this is what we are expecting. That's how it was worded to me. This is what we are expecting. You know, that gives me a great encouragement as a pastor to hear young people say what they are expecting. You know, how many of you have ever talked to a teenager lately? How many of you have had a conversation longer than 30 seconds with a teenager? So what's going on? You talk to them, and then they go, all right. They're like, well, let's hope for a little bit more engagement than that, right? But we, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, and to hear, we are expecting, and this is what we are expecting, coming from teenagers, that's, exci that's exciting to me. Hallelujah. Your hope and expectation shall not be cut off. Amen. What does faith give us the ability to do? 
Come on, you've been here, some of you. If you haven't been here, you're excused from this. But what does our faith give us the ability to do? Overcome. Gosh, come on, people. <laughs> overcome. Say overcome. Say my faith gives me the ability to overcome. Say it again. My faith gives me the ability to overcome. Is that scriptural? Yes, it's scriptural. Hallelujah. Your faith gives you the ability to overcome. Amen. You know what doubt causes people to do? To be overcome. Well, I doubt it. <clears throat> there is so much doubt in the world today. Well, I doubt it could get any better. I doubt this. I doubt this looks bad and that looks bad and this looks bad. All that trying to get their attention caused doubt in their life. Not in us. Amen. Say, I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And what we're expecting, where our faith is, where our faith is focused on, I believe, is what we, is what we get. It's what we have in our life today. And I believe what we're looking at, what we're experiencing today, if you just want to do a self-check of where you're at, it's, it's as a result of where your faith is at. Ouch or amen on that one, but, you know, you, gotta, there, there, you just have to own up to the reality sometimes of where your faith is at. But don't get discouraged and don't lose hope and don't lose your expectation. Keep your expectation on the word, on the promises of God, and you just keep plowing forward. You just keep saying, you know what? Uh, this is this way and this is that way, but I am not losing hope. Amen? Remember, Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but rather he grew strong, not grew weak, right? He became stronger and stronger. Why? I believe he kept it in him and kept it in him. I believe because of his name change, it kept it in him and kept it in him. He's the father of many nations. I'm the father of many nations. And you, I don't care what it is. You could just say, Lord, I thank you that I am debt free. I am debt free. I owe no man nothing but to love him. I thank you that I have more than enough. I thank you, Lord, that I am blessed to give, to, to be a giver to many nations. I th just, just let it come out of you every day. And, and thoughts may come that you're never going to have anything. You'll never have much more than this. You know, you're not gonna. No, you get cast those imaginations down and let the blessing of God come out of your mouth. Amen? And you can say, well, you know, you know uh, everything's okay. You know, we're, we're paying the bills and, you know, everything's going. I'm just... You know, what last week, what, remember what last week, what I said? Expect the best. Say it again, expect the best. And you say, well, you know, everything's okay. But hey, how about expecting for more than enough? What would I do with more than enough? Be a blessing. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> All right. Go to, with me to Genesis 26. 126, excuse me. Because I've got so much in this, and I, I'm just really praying about the direction tonight that we're going to go here with this, with the name of Jesus. But I want to lay a little, I want to review a few things as this foundation in this teaching. And I'm going to read New Living Translation, Genesis 1, 26. <clears throat> says, and God said. Who said this? God. Amen. Do you believe that when God says something, something happens? Yes. Every time? Yes. Amen. So uh, what we're about to read here is that when God said something, it, it took place, right? We can, lead, we can go all through the book of Gen we can, first chapter of Genesis, we can look at God said, God saw, right? And so, if, if this is what we expect of God, what should we expect of ourselves? The same thing, right? It says, and then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us, Right? They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and all small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Right? And God said this, and when he said it, he saw it. Right? Now, what we've been te in this teaching... In, in this teaching is it's entitled How Things Come, right? And in this teaching, what we've seen <clears throat> is that you are precious to God, right? You are a priority to God. You are very important to God. You're the apple of his eye, right? You're, his, you're a God's anointed. You're his most prized possession. It says that he, he watches over you <clears throat> carefully, right? We saw that in Peter. He says he affectionately cares about you uh, uh, watchfully. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we understand that man is very precious to God. 
Man isn't just like any other being. He's not like any of the animal class. And I said a few weeks ago, you know why the missing link is missing is because there is no such thing as the missing link. (laughs) Not too hard to figure that out, right? And I made a comment last week, and I kind of want to pick up on this this week. (coughs) Excuse me. That man has not... When God created man in his image, like we just read here in the book of Genesis, there has been a decrease in what I believe we've seen in humanity as far as you look at man. Man wasn't created a babbling idiot dragging his knuckles along the ground, scratching his head, and grunting, okay? Man was made in God's image. That's not how God is. Why would we think that? Why would we even allow that into our thinking? Well, because you know what they say. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, who said this? Did God say this? You know, when I met my wife, <laughs> you know, you know, two, two personalities come together, and, and little sayings you pick up on, and things like that. And she very consistently said, well, you know, they say, well, you know, they say, we know, and she so often said, well, they say, and I said, now, you know what? Don't say they say unless you can tell me who they is, okay? <laughs> and so I, commi- I, I, I put together what I call the they say committee because I said, <coughs> what we're doing is there's a lot of people that live according to what they say, but there's never an identification of who they are. And I said, I don't want to live my life based on what they is, and, and we can't identify who they are, Right? And so, in this, let's make sure that we're very cautious And well, you know what they say, well, you know what they, you know, and well, you know, I read it in my science book, well, yeah, go back, go to the beginning of that science book and see when that science book was written, and then tell me if that science book has ever been revised, because this Bible has not been revised, this is the Word of God, okay? It, it, it was, and it is, and it always will be, amen. So, there is no revision, to, oh, well, you know, we got that wrong, so let's change that theory, well, let's change that idea. Well, let's change that concept because there's another brilliant mind that's come along. No, God is the brilliant mind. And we are created in his image. And we are to have the mind of Christ. Amen. So let's not dumb down uh, what man was <coughs> and what man can be. Amen. When I say man, I'm referring to mankind, male and female. Amen. So we also saw, <coughs> excuse me, in Psalms 8, go to Psalms chapter 8, verse 3. I'll read this uh, together. And I'll read this out of the Amplified Bible. <clears throat> it says, When I viewed and considered your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have ordained and established, what is man th- that you are mindful of him? So God is mindful of you, isn't he? I said God is mindful of you. You know, what, you know that God knows what size shoe you are? Do you know that he knows what style of shoe you like? That... that <laughs> That sounds so silly, but he does. I mean, I've had, I mean, I can just, the, these little things, I've seen these little things. Even this last week, there were so many little things. I thought, that was just amazing. I told my wife, I said, you know, hey, um, next time you're at the store, will you pick some of this up? Oh, yeah, sure. I go over to my sister's house for dinner Sunday night. She goes, hey, I got an extra box of this. Would you want it? I don't want it anymore. It was exactly what I just asked my wife to go pick up at the store. I'm like, that's the little things. I mean, those are that's the little things. It was just amazing. I mean, it's just little things. He, he knows. He understands these things. And I'm telling you, God is mindful of you. Amen? It says, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of earthborn man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. I want you to think of yourself tonight being crowned with glory and honor. Amen? Say glory (coughs) and honor. (coughs) I think that there are, uh, you know, you turn the television on, I see these shows that are on TV, flipping through the channels, and I see how man is trying to glorify themselves. They try to glorify themselves with what they wear, how they can dance, their talent, their ability, their their ability to play a particular sport, whatever it may be, could be even academically. And it's like, man, it's like, I, I see this mankind, when I say man, strive so hard, be it in their physique, be it in bodybuilding. And I'm not saying that any of these things 
are necessarily bad in themselves, but it gets it gets it can get bad when you're trying to have this thing to sort of bring glory to you. Okay? Bring it to I want attention brought to me because I am now the best. You know the hardest part about being the best in the world is it takes a long time to get there and you don't stay there very long. You hear that? I said it takes a long time to get there and you don't stay there very long. And so you see this, it's like what, what man tries to do, mankind tries to do in the world without God, is they try to be what God has already made them to be. They try to get it a different way, though. They try to get it in a false, perceptive, counterfeited way, okay? And y- when you look at this, is what is man, you are mindful of him, that you care for him, that you made him a little lower than God, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. <laughs> Praise God. You made him to have dominion, right? You made him to have dominion. Say that with me. You made him to have dominion. God has made you to have dominion over this earth. Amen. You know, <coughs> um, I remember I, I taught on this many years ago, and this guy came to this church, and I knew this man uh, since I was a kid, and he said, you know, I've never really thought of it like that. Um, we used to go to the same church together, but the church that we went to wasn't a, what I call, word of faith teaching church, okay? But it was a good church, and he said, you know, you taught that. I've never, I've never thought of doing that. And what it was is I gave a simple example that we went out golfing. It was me and three gentlemen from the church, and we rarely get an opportunity to get together like this, and we went golfing, and so we were really excited about going out golfing, and we get there, and we'd only golfed a couple of holes, and all of a sudden it started. The clouds just rolled in, and it was just dark about as far as we could see, and lightning and pouring rain. And, <coughs> you know, we called the clubhouse, and they, they, they checked the radar, and they said, yeah, you guys might as well bring it back. This is, this is a big storm. It looks like it's here to stay. And we were bummed out because we are like, hey, we hardly ever get to hang out. And, and all of a sudden, we just sat there and said, what are we doing about this? And we just, we said, in the name of Jesus, storm cloud, you go. And we just begin to take authority. So, you know, we came out. We want to enjoy our, our, our time together, enjoy this, and, and the weather clear out. It wasn't, it wasn't five minutes, and it was maybe more like three minutes, all of a sudden, just whoop, sunshine. We could see it all the way around us, every direction. It was raining, absolutely 360 degrees, and every direction we looked, it was raining. Thundering, storming, lightning, and we went, and everywhere we went on that golf course, we get to the 18th hole. We're on the green of the 18th hole. That's the last hole, by the way, in case you don't know that. <laughs> We're on the 18th green, last hole, putting, and it starts to sprinkle. We get done. We grab our ball. We no longer get that thing, and it was like the clouds went, whoop, but we got our whole entire golf game in and just weather free. It was absolutely miraculous. And I just know that God watchfully cares for me. And I know that he's given mankind dominion over this earth. Now, this isn't taught in a lot of churches. I know. And this is far out for some people in their thinking. They think, oh my goodness, are you serious? But look what I'm reading here. Am I reading the scriptures to you? Yet you made him but a little lower than God, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. You're the apple of his eye, right? Anyone who harms you harms my most precious possession, it says in Zechariah. (coughs) Anyone who harms you harms my most precious possession. You're precious to God. I said you're precious to God. Amen? Amen? You know what, the devil? You are not precious to the devil. That might sound silly, but if you're feeling unappreciated, and if you're feeling like you're not special and, and, and not precious to anyone, those are thoughts. The reason I'm telling you is because you need to identify those are thoughts that do not come from God himself. They come from the devil. He is the dammer. Amen. And Jesus is the Messiah. 
He is the one who loves you and has died for you. Amen? And Psalms 115 says that He has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He blesses those who fear Him. He'll bless you both small. He'll increase you, excuse me, uh, more and more. He blesses them that fear Him. You are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, it says. But I'm reading, by the way, Psalms 115, verse 16. But the earth, say, but the earth. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. That's us. Amen. Amen. Now tonight, I really want to teach you in this area. I want us to understand it. And you, you may have heard it a hundred times, but you can hear it a hundred and one, can't you? It's good to hear this stuff. I've heard this stuff for many, many years, and I haven't heard it enough. I need to be reminded of my authority and who I am in Christ Jesus. I need to be reminded that I am precious to God. I need to be reminded that I am his most prized possession. Amen? And I'm telling you, God has committed himself to us. And he's committed himself to his word, hasn't he? Amen. <coughs> um, in Genesis 1.26, let me read this, because we already read, I read it in New Living Translation. Let me read this in the Amplified Bible, just to remind you. It says, God said, let us, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have complete authority. Say, complete authority. Complete authority over the fish, over the birds, over the beasts, and over all of the earth. Over all of the earth. Say that with me. Over all of the earth and every th creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now, we haven't been taught this authority and dominion like we should. And meaning, I, I believe that you just can't hear enough of it. <laughs> it's my mandate. I mean, I was talking to a businessman today and uh, we were talking about some things and, you know, we're just talking about re taking responsibility and, and what we believe. And, you know, I just got, I just get right back into what I'm called to do, which is teach people who they are. It doesn't mean, I n not only do I teach you, but when I'm operating in the world and, and things like that, it comes out of me, I teach the same exact thing. Amen. Why? We, it's not taught enough. I just believe it's not taught enough. I'm not saying, I'm not putting anybody else, I'm just saying we need to hear it. And we need to hear it, and we need to hear it, and we need to hear it, and we need to hear it. And you can say, well, I've heard that before. Well, you need to hear it again. Until you are operating in such a level of godly authority that, that all demons in hell take notice. Amen. Amen. Is this how Jesus operated? Yes. And we're going to look at that. Well, you know what would happen to him? He'd be at somebody's house. There'd be a knock at the door. It wasn't one person. They'd bring all that were sick and possessed of the devil to him. Well, why was that? Because he was so good looking? Because he had, rode a nice donkey? No, it was because of the authority that he was operating in. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> Romans 5.17. Go to there, please. Romans 5.17. Hallelujah. Glory. <clears throat> it's going to be kind of the centerpiece of what we talk about tonight. For if because of one man's trespass, lapse offense, death reigned through that one. Who was that one? That was Adam. Much more, surely, will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and the free gift of righteousness, putting them in the right standing with himself. See, that right there is really what we're talking about. We are in right standing with God himself. I said we are in right standing with God because of what Jesus Christ has done. And when you understand that you are in right standing with God, not based on what you've done, but based on what Jesus has done, right? based on your faith in him. Amen? Then you begin to walk around a little different. You begin to talk different. Say, talk different. And you begin to act different. And what it is, is you begin to reign as kings. That's what it says. Reign as kings in this life, or in life. 
That's talking about this life, right? Reign as kings in life. Say that with me. Reign as kings in life. Say it again. Reign as kings in life. Do you think of yourself as royalty? Do you think of yourself as a king? Do you think of yourself walking around in your own house and in your own affairs, making proclamations, saying things? Kings don't just go, you know, I sure wish that could happen. I doubt it could ever happen. I mean, everything in that kingdom goes to work for that king when he says, that's what I'd like to have happen. That's what's going to happen. Everybody. They don't go around and vote on it and think, well, is it popular? Is it a good idea? They get it done. And I'm telling you, the kingdom of God is at hand. And everything within the kingdom of God goes to work when we make a proclamation, when we decree. That's why I'm telling you, when we speak words, our words should be words of life. Not of profanity. Why? Because it's wrong? Well, because, you know, the FCC says it's wrong? No. Not just because they say it's wrong. We shouldn't be talking profane things because we are kings. <clears throat> and when we, what we proclaim should be. Amen. And we need to begin to think that way according to Mark chapter 11, verse 23, right? So we understand that what we say, what we say, we got to believe in what we're saying is going to come to pass. Amen? Praise God. It says, reign as kings in life <coughs> through the one man, Jesus Christ. You're not doing it on your own. Say, I'm not doing it on my own. <laughs> Say, I'm under his authority. <laughs> Amen. And I said something very important. We don't believe what we believe based on our experience or anyone else's. We believe what we believe based on God's word. Amen? The basis of what we believe is God's word. That's what puts us over. Now, go with me here. Let me fast forward because I want to really get into this here. <clears throat> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Where should we go? Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're learning something tonight. You're growing, you're hearing it, you're receiving it by faith. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6. Say the favor of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Say, I have your favor. At work. At home. On the highway, in all relationships, and all that I do. <laughs> the favor of God. You know, I heard uh, Minister Mike Murdoch say, one day of God's favor is better than a thousand years of, of labor. You know, <clears throat> the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom, Right? Been, I've been meditating and studying on that for my new series that we're going to be starting. And I was thinking about that. Men give under your bosom. I was thinking, you know what? That's a picture of favor. You know the favor of God on your life, what it'll do? People want to bless you. Jeff gave that example. I'd heard that story before that Jerry Seville had shared about that guy who had the, the money had gotten deposited in his bank. <coughs> you know what it was? It was the favor of God. Number one, it was his expectation. He wrote down what, is it, what he was expecting. He got exactly what he was expecting. <coughs> 18 million came in. He said, well, he didn't get the 18 million. But he got exactly where his faith was at. Be it unto you according to your faith. <laughs> and so what happened, you see, the favor of God, the favor of God, people want to do things for you. You know, I, was, I, I met with a businessman years ago, and he said, let me, he said, let me say something to you. He said, what you'll find out about wealthy business people is when they see people of integrity, they want to help you. They want to help you. When I, was, when I was thinking about that, I thought, hmm. He said, because they can earn another X amount of dollars. They can do that, and they will continue to do that, but they can't replicate themselves. And when they see other young people 
wanting to, uh, that are striving and, and endeavoring to, to get into business and do well for themselves and for their families and for their communities and for their churches. He said, that is something that really empowers <coughs> Christian businessmen. I've, I've grown to expect the favor of God. Not in an arrogant way, but in an expectant way on Christ. <clears throat> that wherever I go, the favor of God is there. And God has opened up doors that I didn't even think. I didn't even think, I didn't even know the doors were there, much less that they would be open. And I've seen this, this, this favor of God on my life. Like, th there are so many opportunities. What I'm seeing more and more in my life is how God has so many ways and opportunities to bless us. And what happens is we get our own thinking that limits that in the way. Our thinking gets in the way of how God desires to bless us. But when you have an expectation on the favor of God, it is this absolutely enjoyable way to live. I could go and tell you, honestly, I could stand up here this whole evening and tell you about the favor of God. If I wrote them down, it would take my entire night tonight just to tell you what's happened in the last 12 months. I'm telling you, God has blessed me in ways that I didn't even I didn't even think about. That's what is so fun. I've seen things happen. I've and it's just been it's not been difficult. It has been really simple obedience. You hear his voice, you obey. You hear his voice, you obey. And what has happened is I obey, but as soon as you hear his voice, you have a choice. And when you that with that choice always comes a decision, right? But in the decision process the mind tries to analyze the decision. And what I have found is don't allow the mind to give voice to the decision. Let your heart follow the voice of God and make the decision. Okay? I don't know if you're following me in this, but I hope you are. Because every time I do it, what happens when the mind tries to understand the decision, the best way I know how to describe it is this. Satan, he <coughs> if you think mathematically, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you think mathematically, Satan and God, I know you're going to be like, where is he going with this? Satan subtracts. Satan divides. God adds. He is into addition. God multiplies. And so what happens is as soon as I go begin to think and I look at this decision, in my mind it looks like, oh, that could be subtraction. If you give that amount of money, if you give over there and you go do that, you won't have what you would have if you didn't. And so what the, the tendency is, is to hang on to it, all right? Let me, let me, I got some pieces of paper. I wasn't planning on this, not why these are up here. But if these represented hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars or even th thousand dollar bills, let's just say, right? And God says, give, I want you to come over here and, uh, you know, I want you to give a few thousand over here. And maybe you're not at thousands, that's okay. <coughs> maybe you're at hundreds, maybe you're at one dollar bills, maybe you're at quarters, maybe you're at pennies. It does not matter, the denomination, okay? I want you to make that clear, but I'm just going to use this for example. Um, I want you to give, you know, few thousand over here to this okay all right and then what happened is i was getting it and, and, and this this one particular thing wound up turning into three thousand and so i gave three thousand over there hmm. you know and my mind's going there's three thousand dollars over there you know <coughs> and then lord told me you know i want you to give ten thousand over here to this person over here okay because they're believing here and I want you to give 10000 So I gave, you know, 10000 over there and did that, okay? Oop. And then, then he says, you know, and what's happening, you're sitting here going, hmm. And your mind tries to go <coughs> way out here and try to analyze these figures and, and, and how it's going to happen. And then I want you to do this. It has been absolutely, absolutely, absolutely remarkable. Because what I've asked the Lord to do, and he showed me, I said, Lord, I want to see my seed grow. I don't know if you've ever asked him. You ever asked God to show you? I said, I want to see my seed grow. I can see a natural seed grow. I want to see my seed grow. Oh. And you can say, well, you know, 
is that biblical? Well, first the corn, then the ear, then the full corn and ear. So we, we see how it grows in the Bible. <coughs> it describes a growth process. So I said, I want to see my seed grow. And I want to see it grow in every area where I've sowed it. That's, I just asked him. I didn't demand it. I asked him. And he's been able to show me. He has shown me in every area where I've sown it, how it's come back. And to me, it has been one of the most exciting years of my life. Because I've never, I, what's happened is I've, I've not looked to see that seed grow. And I hadn't, I expected blessing, I expected a return based on, you know, just giving from my heart. But I have seen, I mean, this one, <coughs> I don't want to get into too much detail, but there's this one thing, and, and we, we sowed this, uh, I'll tell you this, and not, this is just the glory and goodness of God. A year ago, I couldn't even have done this, Okay. I didn't have the finances to do this. I didn't have it to give. I had others, to l l smaller amounts to give, but I didn't have it. And this one particular seed, he said, sow $10,000. I sowed, t write a check, $10,000. I wrote the check, but I hadn't given it to the person. But I had it, and I was going to give it to the person. As I'm going in the car, driving to give it to this person, I get an email that we got $10,000. Something else. I hadn't even got, <laughs> this, this is good ground. I know it's good ground when it hadn't even hit the ground and it's already growing, right? Boom. <clears throat> then, I'm like, well, I know that's not the end of that seed. It's not a one for one. There was another thing that we had, and I, I, we, had, we had sold some product to, to, uh, to uh, a company, and we had to pay a certain amount. We bought the product, and we sold the product, okay? And there was markup on the product, but it, was, it wasn't wasn't a tremendous amount. Well, the company that I bought it from said, you know what, um, we're only going to charge you for this much because we're fine with that. It was kind of extra that we had. Another $10,000 profit. $10,000 profit off it. All I did was pick up the phone and said, would you like this product? Yeah, we'd like it. Okay, you can have it. We have seen this over and over and over and just... And, and what's been so exciting about it is it's not a one-time deal. I do it. I am looking for the next time to give already. I, every day, well, that's one of the things we say. Lord, I, I speak the favor of God, the blessing of God over my life. And I said, Lord, I will sow into others today. I said, Lord, thank you for ideas, resources, and relationships that you are bringing into my life to fulfill the vision that you have given me, Right? I'm looking every day. Who do you want me to sow into? Who do you want me to sow into? What would you have me to do? It, is a, it, it, is, it becomes a lifestyle of giving, and I'm learning it. I've done, I've, li I've given for, for many, many, many years, but I'm telling you, it has exponentially grown in here. And that's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm trying to teach you here with this. It is, it is, it is something that takes place in our heart and in our life, and I'm seeing the dominion over all the earth. Go, you're in Hebrews, did I have you go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. And be not slothful, and be not slothful, say that with me, and be not slothful. So when he says to give, when do you think you should give? Immediately. I mean, just do it now. Because what I'm saying is, when, you, when the Lord puts something on your heart, your mind tries to analyze this decision process, just, just do it. Don't be slothful about it. Okay? Don't be slothful about it. Just do it. But followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. How do we inherit the promises? Faith and patience. Amen? I don't want to teach too, too long on that because I could. Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11, 6. <clears throat> Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. You've got to believe that God is, don't you? We have to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder. Say, God is my rewarder. Much of mankind is wanting to be rewarded by mankind. 
But you need to understand that God is a rewarder. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I believe this is every day, folks. Every day. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who have not believed, lest the light of the glorious gospel, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Here's basically what this teaching is talking about. Mankind had authority in the Garden of Eden, in, man, in Adam and Eve, right? Mankind gave over that authority in the Garden to Satan. <clears throat> Jesus came and got that authority back. That's what we looked at last week when we talked about how Jesus was tempted. We said, well, it was a temptation because the Bible says it was a temptation. You said, well, he's a liar. Well, no, it says the, that Jesus was tempted. We know he's a liar, but I'm telling you that Jesus was tempted by Satan. And Satan said, you know, if you do this, all these kingdoms will be yours. But see, Jesus was called to lord over those kingdoms in the first place. But he wasn't to get it Satan's way. He was to get it God's way. Amen? And we said that there's a counterfeit. So you come up, you're trying to achieve something in your life. Don't settle for a counterfeit. Don't try to shortcut to get to something another way. Okay? I don't care if that's in a relationship with somebody. You know, here, here's an example. I have seen this where God brings two people together. They love one another. They care for one another. And all of a sudden, one of them gets scared. And they get scared, now they start to control, try to control the other one. A gift, and a beautiful gift and relationship that God's brought into their life, they try to control them. They're afraid, they let fear come in, that they're going to lose this person. So they go about it trying to make this relationship work, and next thing happens, no work. Why? You're trying to get this relationship another way. And you try to do it by all kinds of worldly ways to make this relationship work. Just trust the Lord. Just put God, you've probably heard this, but it's not, it, it's not just a cliche, it's a reality. Put God in the center of that relationship. Pray together, speak God's word together, develop in that relationship between you and God, and I'm telling you, that is the way that the relationship will work. And it's the only way, I'm convinced, it's the only way it'll truly last, and you'll have peace in that relationship. The God kind of peace. You'll prosper in your relationship. It is a beautiful thing. Amen? Jesus came, got it back, the, the authority of, uh, that was in the earth back, the dominion. Mankind now has been given that authority through the name of Jesus. Go to Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Amen. Say, I have authority through the name of Jesus. You don't have to put up with anything that is not of God anything. Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed unto all men, for all, that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned. Say, death reigned. When death reigned, the devil reigned. Okay? The devil reigned. From Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is, in, who is the figure of him that was to come? But not as the offense, so also is, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift for it. For if through the offense of one man be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by the one man by the one man, by the one man, doesn't say the one God, this is the one man. That's important. Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Now I'm going to read this New Living Translation. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, People sinned even before the law was given, but it was not accounted as sin because there was not yet any law to break, right? We know that. Still, anyone, everyone died, <clears throat> says. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, and I won't get into that because there's a whole teaching on, you know, the, the bosom and so on and so forth, but, you know, in the resurrection, you'll, you, can, you see the whole picture of all those that died before that. Even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God, as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin 
and God's gracious gift. There's a big difference. Now, a lot of times in church, you're taught that there's a difference, but the difference is actually the opposite way of how the Bible talks. There is a big, great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. I, and what I mean by that, let me, let me quantify what I'm saying here, because you might be wondering what I mean by that. There is such a sin mentality. There is such a sin consciousness. And as a result of it, it belittles people and it just extinguishes their faith. Because they're so conscious of sin as opposing to being conscious of the gift of grace of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's, it's deadly. It's really what it is. It's absolutely deadly. And it puts the focus, you know, and in, in, in the familiar things are, well, you know, we're all sinners. You know, how many of you are sinners? I mean, the church that I used to go to, the pastor almost every week said, how many of you are sinners? Everybody waves their hand, you know. Those who didn't raise their hand, we'll cast out the demons later, you know. And, and, and what it is, and, and a great guy, super nice guy, loving pastor, but the reality is that God's grace and his gift, I'm telling you, there is a big difference. And the big difference is that the gift of grace, the gift of righteousness, the gift of Jesus Christ to our li life and in our life has redeemed us from the curse of the law and put us back in a position of royalty with God himself. It has put us in right standing with God the Father. So no longer do you and I need to identify ourselves and allow ourselves to be identified by our sin. Amen? <clears throat> you, ever, you ever see, I, I've never been to a class reunion. But, you know, you see commercials and things like that on how class reunion, they, they go rent, there was a rental car commercial, and they go try to rent the fanciest car, and where, you know, trying to be somebody that, you know, that, that they've, they, they are now that they weren't in high school. You know, even mankind doesn't want to be identified by their past. They want to be identified by who they are now and their accomplishments. Well, why is it as Christians that we would settle for being identified with our past? That goes absolutely against our nature uh, of who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, it says, For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater, say even greater, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness to many through this one man, Jesus Christ. Hmm. Hebrews 2.14 says, For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. Say that with me. That had the power of death. Say it again. That had the power of death. Satan no longer has the power of death. You see, we are to rule and reign in this life under our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and it makes us happy to rule and reign under him. That's when, you, that's when you flourish. I said, that's when you flourish. But when you try to rule from out from underneath him, that's when pressure comes in. When you try to figure it out on your own, you better figure it out. You better figure this out. How are you going to figure that out? How are you going to figure that out? How are you going to pay that bill? How are you going to figure out this situation? <clears throat> How are you going to do that? That's when pressure comes in, folks. That's when stress comes in. That's when people start to worry, start to get all anxiety, try to get it all figured out. And you know what really it is? You try to be your own God. And everyone in this room has tried to do that at one point in time in their life. And you are not good at it because you're not designed to be your own God. We are designed to be under his authority and under his uh, leadership, amen? And when we're under his rule and leadership, I'm telling you, that is when things are glorious, marvelous, wonderful. It is the best place to live. <clears throat> amen? <laughs> this is how we succeed, by staying under him. 
In fact, all failure, I wrote this down, Lord gave it to me, all failure is a result of getting out from underneath his authority. All failure is a result of getting out from underneath the authority of Jesus Christ. Luke, Luke 4, I'm just going to read these to you. Listen to this. Luke 4, I'll read a few verses here. It says, The people were amazed and exclaimed, What authority and power this man's words possess. Even evil spirits obey him, and they flee at his command. Mm. Now, it's important not only to look and think at like this, but um, it's also important to understand that here's what a lot of people's mentality is. Well, you know, Jesus had that authority and that power and so on and so forth, um, and he could do those things and the, because, you know, he was the son of God. Listen, yes, he's the son of God, but you need to correct this in your thinking. He was not doing these things as the son of God. He was doing these things as a man. And that's very important for us to know and it's very important for us to understand because what happens is that you begin to make excuse for your failure and why you can't do things because, well, you know, Jesus did those things, but I could never do those things. You know, you know and, and there's a double standard. What I'm reading to you in Genesis, what I'm reading to you in Psalms, what I'm reading to you in the New Testament is that you are to rule and reign, that you're kings in this earth, amen? And we rule and reign through the one, Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> So it's not like, well, he ruled and he reigned and he was sure special. He was special. I'm not, I'm not discounting his specialness. I'm saying, though, that you are a child of the living God. And you have been given authority through that name. Amen? And the Spirit of God is in you. The same Spirit, the Bible says, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And it will quicken your mortal body. Amen? Amen? That's a, John 14, 10. It says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Jesus says, The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. This is what Jesus said. But the Father that dwells in me, he does the work. Jesus himself is saying, It's not me doing this. I'm doing what my Father tells me to do, and he does the work. Say that with me. He does the work. You know what? The Father dwelling in you, he does the work. He does the work. How in the world is a man born in Africa, comes to the United States, goes to a Kenneth Copeland meeting, gets three books, goes back to Africa in the middle of the jungle, and the Lord says to start a church. He didn't own one square meter of ground, not one square, a square yard basically, of ground. Didn't own any land at all. And the Lord said, I want you to build an auditorium that seats 50,000 people, okay? 50,000 people. <laughs> I don't own anything. I don't have anybody coming to my church. And he said, and I want you to build it in 12 months. And I want you to build it debt-free. And I want you build, to build it without getting any money from America or Europe. I want you to build it with African money. How does that happen? God kind of faith. God kind of faith. He thought, I've never, he'd only seen 50,000 people on TV at like a soccer event. He'd never seen 50,000. He goes, if I built a 50,000-seat auditorium, where would 50,000 people come from? And, why would he, and he goes, why would we build a 50,000-seat auditorium for people to come to maybe once, and that's it? When you, you think about that now, they're doing that, though, with soccer stadiums and Olympic stadiums. But guess what? You know there isn't 50,000 people that come to that church every week? There isn't. They built it. They built it debt-free, and they built it in 12 months. But there's not 50,000 people that come to it. There's 250,000 people that come to the church. 
and they have five services to get them in and out. Who God kind of faith? Folks, this faith is in you. Don't think that you, if you have financial, relationship, physical, that faith works for that too. We have mountain moving faith. This same pastor said something that made me go sit up in my seat. He made a comment to the effect of, if there's not evidence and substance in your life, your faith is fake. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. That was a pretty big statement, but coming from a man like that, I shared a video with him. I think they have 15,000 employees. They have two universities now. Two, I think they're working on a third university, I believe. They have their own banks, their own banking system. They have their own stores. They're building a homes. I think they're building about 15,000 homes for their staff. And they did this in the middle of the jungle. Or, yeah, the jungle. And he said, well, how are the people going to get from there to here? He said, well, we're building a high-speed rail. They're building a, a man, a pastor, is doing this in Africa. And it's just thousands and thousands and thousands of people every week are coming in and saying. And he, said, and, and, and he asked this guy from America, he said, well, how are you going to get the money for the rail? He said, we already have it. It's already paid for. We haven't even started construction. I want to encourage you. There is so much in you. There is so much in you. And start, start wherever you're at. Start. Just start. Start wherever you're at. Don't say, oh, well, I could never do that. Don't let that. That's not your vision. That's not your goal. But God's put visions and goals inside of you. He's putting things inside of you for your family. We started with vacations. We, my wife and I was like, I'm the kind of guy, I just kind of work, and I would work. I'd work a lot. <laughs> and I'd work 10, 12, 15 hours. Didn't bother me. I just work, you know. And, and you know, and she's like, huh. And we'd wor I'd work vacation. I never went. I didn't. I just well, vacations wasn't much of what I did. You know, I didn't. Couldn't wait for the vacation. You know, but she liked them. And I thought, you know what? I better start taking notice here because she really likes to do stuff like that. And I mean, I like it, but it wasn't like what I lived to do. So we put our faith out there. We wrote it down in our journal. Remember, we talked about the vision, little vision books. I got more of them in case you lose yours or don't have one. We started writing it. We wrote in there that we would go on vacation for a month out of the year. A month of vacation a year. Not all at once, but a month of the year. We know we've done that. This is the third year we'll be doing that. You know when it started? It started the year we wrote it in our vision book and put our faith on it. And that we it wouldn't be a stretch that we'd have the money, we'd have the time, that the people, the resources would come in and fill the gaps and things like that. You know what we were trying to do by not doing it? I was trying to be my own God. I want you to get that. Well, I can't leave. I've got businesses to run. I've got a church to pastor. I've got this. I've got that. <laughs> me, me, me. I didn't have to. I had to put my faith on it. It can be a vacation. It can be cars. It can be, oh, well, I wouldn't ask for tangible things. Why not? They needed tax money. What did Jesus say to do? Go, 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 Peter. Go down fishing. Catch fish. First fish you pull up, open his mouth. There'll be money in there to pay our taxes. That's a tangible thing people. It's interesting because there Jesus said there's a whole there's a lot of lessons in it but he says that we wouldn't offend them. That we wouldn't offend that you know it's harder to win a man than a whole an offended man than a whole city. He just did it so he wouldn't offend them. So he went and got money to bless them if you think of it so they wouldn't be offended. There's a whole teaching I'm looking at and studying on this stuff. Do you ever think about just giving somebody something because you don't want to offend them? Didn't say they deserved it. Didn't say they had rights to it. Didn't say they owed it to them. They didn't want to offend them.
Jesus said, give it to them so they're not offended. Stand to your feet. You know what that is? Number one, that's compassion. Jesus was operating in compassion. Number two, you know what Jesus was doing in that example? He was acting as a man in authority with dominion over all the earth. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for showing us areas of our life to increase, to grow, to stretch ourselves, to believe for the best, and that our hope and our expectation would not be cut off. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful master plan that you have for our lives. Help us to not be small-minded, but that we would see as you would have us to see. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll share one more thing with you. The guy who built the 50,000-seat auditorium, one thing he said, I'll never forget it, he said, the greater the light, the further you can see. You know what I thought of? I thought of the Baja 1000, I think it is. The Baja 1000 is a race that they do down through Baja, California, right? And they race these, these vehicles down through the desert. It's really intriguing to me. A couple of my friends have, have done it. And those, if you ever watch the serious racers, they have dune buggies or motorcycles. It is so dark out in that desert that the front of those vehicles are so lit up. I mean, they'll have 5, 10, 15, 20 lights on those vehicles so they can see because they're moving at a high pace of speed, at a high rate of speed at night. And they need to be able to see way across what they're, where they're driving. The word, the Bible says, the entrance of his word gives light and gives understanding. I'm telling you, as we look at, into this perfect law of liberty, as we look into the word, it, it causes us to see things by faith and to see further, and it causes us to go at a faster rate. Because I believe God wants us to kind of get some things done in this earth. Amen. Well, we love you. You're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Blessed going in, blessed going out. Everything you set your hand to, what happens? Prospers. You're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking. You're dismissed. We'll see you Sunday. Hallelujah. As the